So I just saw Dawn of the sequel of the remake and it was eh. Now you don't have to tell me how unoriginal and recycled that joke is because I'm well aware of that, but I figured it was most appropriate to use for this movie because that's exactly what this movie is. This is easily one of the most cliched movies I've seen in the past several years. If you fit the category of someone who has seen a Hollywood blockbuster in the past 10 years and has the magical ability to retain information through a process called memory, then you can pretty much guaranteed stay 20 minutes ahead of this movie at all times. Now if you're gonna make the argument that I'm supposed to shut off my brain and not think about things during the movie, then I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree, because the type of films that I praise on this channel are the ones that don't get worse the more you think about them. Now I'm gonna take this opportunity to issue a spoiler warning and apologize to those who wanted a spoiler-free review of this film. It's already going to be extremely difficult to try and articulate these points to people that love this film, so I'm going to try and be as specific as I possibly can. First off, before everybody loses their heads, I want to point out that I believe in giving credit where credit is due. There's a few things in this film that stand out as being particularly well done. Second, despite my tone of voice, I'm giving this film a positive rating. So if you're gonna get upset over my 6 out of 10 rating, just remember that you're not getting upset over me saying the movie is bad, but merely that I don't think it's as great as you think it is. Like I said, I believe in giving credit where credit is due, but I also believe in not giving credit where credit isn't due. The aspect of this movie that I think deserves the most credit is the animation. In fact, I might even buy a ticket to the next movie just to see how much technology is improved. Because although we aren't yet at the point where we can't tell that these apes aren't computer animated, there were parts of this movie that made me think, holy shit, we're getting really close. Certain angles and lighting conditions worked better than others for the majority of the apes, and it was clear that they spent more time on some character models than they did other ones. But that fucking orangutan, Jesus Christ, if this wins them the Oscar for best visual effects, I will not be disappointed. At certain points in the film, I even thought, you can't get a real orangutan to do that. What the, what, what? This aspect alone is worth bringing the entire movie from an average rating to an above average rating, but that isn't the only reason why it's a six to me instead of a five. Despite Gary Oldman's quick appearance in this film, he did do a great job with his performance. And I loved the scene with him looking at photos on his tablet when the power comes back in the city. Not only because they didn't use that opportunity to gratuitously shove a brand name in your face, but because it's proof that you can still include something as cliched as showing a character tear up looking at photos of their missing and or deceased family members, but tweak it in a way that's not only tailored to fit the film, but be unique and interesting. In less than 30 seconds and with almost no dialogue, the film manages to make a statement on how the way that our generation saves information has become extremely dependent on powering our electronic devices. So not only does it make Gary Oldman's performance that much more powerful because we can imagine how long it's been since he's even seen those photographs, but the fact that it's building off of and reimagining an already universally well-known cliche makes it work even better because it forces us to compare the scene to ones where actual photographs are being used and thus better understand and relate to the character's tears of joy. Whoever wrote this scene into the movie, thank you because it is the only scene that caught me off guard as being particularly well-written. Now I understand that well-written to a lot of people can be described as anything that's not poorly written that they enjoy watching, and I can agree it's not poorly written hence me not rating this film below a 5. But aside from a few things that I just pointed out, this movie is the epitome of formulated, cliched, and unexceptional. Within the first five fucking seconds of the movie we see a montage of news reports. Like I get that there's things that happen between the last movie and this one that you want to explain to us so we know what's going on, but is there no other way to relay that information to us? I don't even see that many Hollywood blockbuster movies because I generally try to avoid them because it feels like I'm watching the exact same movie over and over. But oh, what a surprise, the very last movie that I saw in theaters before this one did the exact same thing. I don't understand how this could have happened. Could we not even see a movie open up with just one news report that relays the exact same information instead of this cliched ADHD montage of all of them? Nope, because that would be slightly different. And here in Hollywood, different equals risky business investment. Near the beginning of the film, the soundtrack makes a nice little nod to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Anyone familiar with the film would instantly recognize what the soundtrack was imitating. And considering this happens right before they show apes not only using advanced hunting techniques, but also using tools, I thought it was very fitting. Extremely short-lived, but fitting. After that moment in the film, the soundtrack quickly nosedives into being one of the most cookie-cutter soundtracks I've ever heard. Again, I will repeat, cookie-cutter does not equal bad, but it also does not equal exceptional. If you fed a computer program every soundtrack from every Hollywood blockbuster action movie in the past 10 years, this is the soundtrack it would come up with. And the worst part about the soundtrack wasn't even necessarily how it was written, but the fact that they really overkilled its use. Now, I'm definitely not saying that a movie can't be great if it's soundtrack heavy, but when it goes past the point of emphasizing an emotional 
emotion portrayed on screen and into the realm of replacing your emotions with the ones that it feels you're supposed to have, it makes me wish that certain scenes in this movie had a little bit more self-restraint. Most notably when Koba first finds these two guys wasting their ammo shooting a vehicle all day. At first he looks aggressive and then he puts on a happy face to try and deceive them and starts acting playful. And whereas this could be a moment with legitimate tension as to whether or not he would attack them, instead the movie insists on throwing in that high-pitched staccato string instrument plucking bullshit. Like, Derp, this is a goofy scene and you're not allowed to interpret things for yourself. Nothing bad will happen in this scene because we are using goofy music. And wouldn't you know it, the next time that Koba does the exact same thing but actually has plans to kill them, the soundtrack takes on a completely different tone and effectively spoils the outcome of the scene as you're watching it. Now this criticism is definitely more relevant for the first time it happens rather than the second, because even with that unnecessary reinforcement, it should be pretty obvious how things are gonna go down the second time anyway. So if this were the only complaint I had about the movie, then obviously it wouldn't carry that much weight. But this is just one of many examples of this film insisting on being as predictable as it possibly can. The first human character that we see is some trigger-happy jerk that decides to shoot an ape for no reason. And I guess for the sake of being specific, I'm going to clarify that it wasn't technically no reason and he was obviously scared and a jerk. And since I've seen a Hollywood blockbuster in the past 10 years and also can retain information through memory, by the end of the scene it was excruciatingly obvious that this specific character was going to cause some more plot device drama between now and the end of the film. Which was even further reinforced by the fact that they got back to the city and then when the main character went back to the forest again they brought this guy with him. Literally he serves no other purpose than to be that obvious bad guy on the human side. The one guy that you know has already shot an ape and you're bringing him with you to the forest where you're about to ask the apes to do you a favor. This happening directly after we've established the tense political climate between the species. Hmm, I wonder if anything's going to go wrong on this mission and specifically be caused by this one character. Oh, oops, it turns out that he's the one guy that didn't respect their wishes to not bring his gun. Nobody could have seen this coming. Nice job leaving your bag open for some reason, you idiot. Could the exact same plot devices not have affected the script in the exact same way without it being so predictable? Could we not have had another character accidentally shoot an ape at the beginning? What would you have lost by doing that other than the ability to sell this movie to people with an IQ of less than 40? When you pander your movie towards people who can't fucking figure shit out unless it's blatantly spelled out for them a million times, then sure you get to sell more tickets, but then the movie becomes the most predictable thing in the world for people who have seen other movies and have a memory. Every single scene in the movie I found myself begging, please have the sequence of events play out in a way that I don't already expect it to. But sure enough, every single time it ended with, nope, because that would be slightly different. If you're not conscious of these cliches, then I'm happy for you that you get to enjoy the same movie over and over again. But acting as though I'm supposed to somehow not be conscious of them as I'm watching a movie is about the same as acting as though I'm supposed to somehow not be conscious of what letter comes next in the alphabet while someone sings the ABCs. When we establish that Koba has started rebelling and killing humans, and then later show the only exaggeratedly and intentionally unlikable human character alone in a vehicle at night, I don't understand how I'm supposed to be able to not have a voice in my head saying Koba's going to kill him right now. When you pick the most predictable outcome to the scene possible every single time, it reinforces that the following scenes will also do that. Adam, you're just nitpicking. You're just supposed to focus on the, the rich and developed characters. Like stereotypical white male lead number 748, and stereotypical useless love interest number 643, and stereotypical teenage son character number 311 whose only defining trait is that he has a hobby. Seriously, if anybody's going to defend the development of his character by saying he draws, then I can't imagine what you'd be missing if you were ever shown a character with more depth than a cutting board. Can someone please describe this man's character without also describing a rock. Well, if we give him any personality traits, then the people in the audience that don't have those very specific personality traits will instantly find him unrelatable. If we keep him as much of a blank slate as possible, then everyone in the audience will be able to project their own personalities onto the main character and like him regardless. Yay! The less effort you spend on writing, the more accessible the film becomes. Let's throw a young person who can't act into our movie so that the main character becomes relatable. Let us make it abundantly clear that we do not respect the intelligence of our target audience. Why would we give characters personality when we could just give them
them props instead. We don't expect a white male with a wife and child to be able to relate to a character that isn't a white male with a wife and child. That would require empathy, and we do not believe that our target audience is capable of that. Even the fucking main ape character has props. Is his wife the only female ape there is? Am I saying that all movies where a white male character has a wife and child are bad? Of course not, and you're missing the point. The point is that if you're going to include a character in your movie and pretend as though they're not a prop to the main character, you should probably have them fulfill a purpose in the story that isn't just being a prop to the main character. I mean, come on, the closest thing that we got to that was the wife saying, I brought antibiotics with me. And even that sliver of pretend purpose is overshadowed by just how cliched that entire scene is. I understand that there's some distrust between our two communities, but I see that one of you is really sick and it turns out we're the only people that can help you with that. Well, just because one of us is on the brink of death, I'll accept your offer begrudgingly. Oh, hey, it turns out it worked. Now our communities have a little bit more trust with one another. I understand that there's not much in this movie that they technically did wrong, but they are reciting the fucking alphabet and somehow I'm supposed to be entertained like, ooh, ha, 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 Q comes after P. Didn't see that one coming. I wonder what's gonna happen next. This is entertainment. Please make more movies like this. Sadly, not all of the cliches that appeared in this film weighed the film down just because they were cliches. There are things that happen in this film that are already stupid, and it's just insult to injury that it's also a cliche. Like, nobody found it incredibly stupid and pandering when Caesar looked at the footage of James Franco. I mean, I get that they really wanted to emphasize the they're not so different after all cliche. But was that the only reason why they showed up at James Franco's house? Did they decide that going to that place for that purpose was more important than finding a practical place to hide out while the apes attacked the city? Is that where they were planning on going to hide out in the first place, or was it just the most convenient thing in the world that it happened to work out? No, guys, I understand that while you're driving me, we could be killed by apes at any moment, but we have to go to James Franco's house so we can tear jerk the audience later. There was a fight scene in the movie that I was pretty into. You know, the one where Caesar strangles Koba and there's actually blood? And that would be a great scene altogether if they didn't insist on prefacing it with the cliche of, protagonist, you're showing empathy towards that other community. Now I'm going to pull a hardcore straw man and pretend as though that means that you like their community more than you like our community. Caesar love humans more than apes. So Caesar gets shot by Koba in a way that's staged to make it look like the humans did it. And then we get the cliche of, hey, I'm a main character and I just got shot, but since I did not get shot in the head, I am going to come back later in the movie because I did not die even though nobody knows it yet. So the apes wreak some havoc in the city because of the let's go to war under false pretenses cliche. Then we get the impractical dual wielding but it looks cool cliche, wherein Koba is somehow able to flawlessly maneuver which direction his horse is turning without actually touching its reins or mane. And then then we get the cliche of, oh, I'm lying down with a serious injury. Quick, play some sad music while I explain to you that the character who is responsible for doing this to me is somebody who you previously trusted and they betrayed us. And then that turns into the cliche of, time for me to beat up the main villain of this movie in a climactic fight scene despite the fact that I've been bleeding from an untreated bullet wound for the past 24 hours, which wouldn't be as bad if the movie didn't treat him as though he was fucking dying beforehand. Not only is he struggling to climb up the fucking ladder to the fight scene itself, but in the previous scene when he was explaining shit to his completely characterless son, they felt it absolutely necessary to include the cliche of, I'm lying down with a horrible injury and I'm going to attempt to sit up, but it hurts too much so I'm going to lie back down again and the character next to me is going to feel really sorry for me. Like, the fight scene wouldn't have been completely ruined if they didn't previously show those two moments of him struggling to fucking move. No, let's just have him swinging around and beating the guy up. Nobody's gonna remember five minutes ago. And of course, the the result of this fight scene turns into the evil villain hanging from the edge of a cliff cliche. And of course this prompts the evil villain to use the if you're such a good guy then how come you're going to kill me right now cliche. And of course this leads to the evil villain meeting his ultimate demise by falling to his death cliche. Anyway that pretty much sums up why I'm unable to give this movie a better rating than above average. There were small parts of the film that I really liked and I think I made some pretty good arguments for those parts. So if you're going to make the argument that I'm 
supposed to like something that I didn't, would you please be so kind as to provide similar attemptedly objective reasoning behind your own claims? My position is not that you're not supposed to like it and that your reasons for liking it are invalid, but merely that my reasons for being unable to enjoy the movie are not invalid reasons. If you enjoy the movie, then good for you. You're not wrong for enjoying it. But criticizing a movie for repackaging the same film I've already paid full price for a million times when it's being branded as something new is hardly nitpicking. Oftentimes I feel like people slap the word nitpicking onto anything that they didn't personally notice themselves. I draw the line somewhere too, guys. It's not like I'm dwelling on the fact that none of the apes have genitals. Is it too much to ask that when a new movie comes out and it advertises itself as a new movie that I would be able to see a new movie? As much as you might want to discount everything I said under the guise of, Adam, you went into this movie wanting to hate it and that's the only reason you did because you make up your mind before you see movies and you don't like things that are popular and have a big budget and come from Hollywood. If that's seriously what you believe, then you'll have to explain why I loved the Lego movie so much and why I hate so many other bullshitty indie movies so much as well. I give credit where I think credit is due and I'd like to think that I provide a decent argument in doing so. Movies like Prisoners are still crowd-pleasing and written by the book, but there's enough intelligent choices within the film that make it feel like it was written by an actual person and not a computer. Yes, the animation was fucking fantastic and I'm not going to deny that, so excuse me for reviewing this movie as a movie and not a tech demo. Even though I've tried to make myself as clear as possible, it's obvious that there'll still be some people who think that I only dislike this because I'm trying to be different and contrarian. And I guess it makes enough sense that that would happen, because it has become quite the predictable cliché.